Can I put that under there? Look for. Do you want me to welcome or not? We're going to get going in a second, but I might invite, I might invite you to uh, consider whether you'd like to come into closer orbit with our conversation. Um, there might be some more people drifting in at the back, uh, and they might sit up the back, but if, if you feel like it, you are most welcome to increase your proximity to the speakers and make them feel like that they're actually speaking to someone that they can address. So thank you for coming for this, what promises to be an uh, interesting discussion, I, I think, uh, about dark matter and our wonder in relation to dark matter. Uh, my name's Mick Douglas. I'm an artist and a creative practice researcher at RMIT in the School of Design. Uh, firstly, I want to acknowledge that we are gathering on the unceded sovereign lands of the Boon Wurrung and Woon Wurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and that we pay our respects to their past elders and present elders, of which we are very lucky to have one here today, and emerging <laughs> uh, elders. <laughs> that always happens. We have some technical uh, expertise here though for iPads that aren't working. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be great. So dark matter and dark energy is thought to make up nearly 95% of the universe and is constantly passing through us and our planet. Uh, research into dark matter will soon be undertaken at the Stahl Underground Physics Lab, or SUPL for short, in Western Victoria. The lab's location, one kilometre underground in the Stahl Gold Mine, 
will provide necessary radiation shielding against background cosmic rays with the research set to complement that which is already undertaken in the northern hemisphere. So this panel discussion is really convened to explore the potential of artistic research in relationship with dark matter scientific research and indigenous astronomical knowledge. The prospect of there being more dark matter in the cosmos than anything else is a lure for artistic poesis and scientific hypothesis, while inviting deeper learning with Indigenous Australians' wealth of continuing cultural knowledge of the night sky and stars. The enigma of unseen matter that we know to be there, but yet is so difficult to directly detect, compels creative research. How might we respond to the wonder that the universe inspires in this era of human-induced change on Earth? Before I introduce the panel, I firstly just want to invite you to turn your phones off so that we can maintain our attention. Um, also to let you know that this event is being audio recorded and some photographic images taken. Uh, that will be made available online for public free dissemination. Um, and in your being here, uh, we believe that you're consenting to those recordings and images being made. Firstly, I want to introduce my co-convener, Janine Randerson. She's a media artist, curator, creative practice researcher and associate professor at Auckland University of Technology, and she recently authored the MIT Press published Weather as Medium, and she is the host of Leonardo's Auckland chapter of Laser Talks. And Janine will briefly introduce our presenting associated partners. I'll explain what, what laser uh, talks actually mean. So the, the acronym is the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. Um, I've been working for quite a long time with Leonardo Journal peer reviewing and also they were the, the Leonardo book series published my book. So they encouraged me to open an Auckland chapter of the laser talks to be part of the wider Leonardo network. So many of you will know that the Leonardo Journal was established around 50 years ago now, and one of the founders was an astrophysicist, appropriately enough for this, for this evening, uh, Frank Molina. And Roger Molina, his son, continues some of Leonardo's work. So we're really delighted to have Leonardo as one of the partners for this event, and, and they've promoted it through their network internationally as well. And that's another reason for our sound recording, so we can spread what's happening here internationally. So in the Antipodean context, both Mick and I, I think, are really keen to extend this conversation between the sometimes rarefied sphere of art and science into a decolonial context and to make sure that indigenous voices and all the, the different kinds of indigenous concepts of cosmology enter the conversation right at the beginning. So that might be a bit of a, a shift to how our, our colleagues have done it in the USA. And we're also really delighted to have partners a partnership with ANAT for this event. So um, ANAT is a it isn't an acronym anymore, but some of you might know it as the Australian Network for, for Art and Technology. And for 30 years, they have expediated conversations in Australia between artists and scientists and continue to do amazing work in that field. So I'll turn now to Mick to introduce our amazing guest tonight. Thank you. So... I'm going to introduce all of the speakers. They are each going to speak for 10 minutes and then we're really wanting to open up to a discussion and that will include an invitation for you to join that discussion towards the, towards the end. Uh, my curiosity with this dark matter research commenced a year ago when I found myself coming into relationship with country in seven kilometres out of Stall in Western Victoria on the unceded sovereign lands of the Jaburung, 
to then become aware that this dark matter research is happening in the Stahl gold mine. So as an artist, it seemed to me uh, of great opportune moment to explore what might be intersections of artists and scientists and Indigenous astronomical knowledge. Uh, I'm personally uh, honoured to be able to have Pabin Atta Carolyn Briggs, AM, uh, Boon Wurrung Senior Elder and the Chairperson and Founder of the Boon Wurrung Foundation. Aunty Carolyn is a descendant of the First Peoples of Melbourne, the Yalakut Wheelam clan of the Boon Wurrung. She's the great granddaughter of Louisa Briggs. Carolyn has been involved in developing and supporting opportunities for Indigenous youth and Boon Wurrung culture for over 40 years, with significant work in cultural research, including restoration of the Boon Wurrung language, and authoring the book, Journey Cycles of the Boon Wurrung, Stories with Boon Wurrung Language. Next to Aunty Carolyn is Jeremy Mould, who's an Australian astronomer interested in galaxies and cosmology and the late stages of stellar evolution. He's a lead supple researcher who identified Stahl Gold Mine as a potential lab site and a chief investigator of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics, working in the Dark Matter program. He was a previous director of the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics at ANU and the American National Optical Astronomy Observatories and is currently professor at the Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing at Swinburne University. They've all lined up. Lucy Bleach uh, will speak next, who is a Tasmania-based artist whose practice focuses on humans' enduring relationships to geologically volatile environments, seeking engagement with communities that experience such relationships and researchers who monitor the Earth's movement. She works across sculptural objects, architectural forms and geoacoustics with an installation-based approach to generate artworks where processes, forms and actions are informed by geologic force and the resulting instability and transformation. Lucy has produced solo, commissioned and collaborative works, exhibited nationally and internationally and undertaken research projects in geologically unstable regions in Italy, Japan, Hawaii and Vanuatu. Duane is about to enter the room with impeccable timing. <coughs> Duane researches cultural astronomy, <laughs> indigenous astronomical knowledge, dark sky studies, astronomical heritage and the history and philosophy of science. He works closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across Australia and Indigenous communities in Thailand, Central America, the USA and Canada, and works to increase Indigenous representation in the astronomical and space sciences in Australia. He's Associate Professor of Cultural Astronomy in the ARC Centre for, of Excellence in All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions, called Astro 3D, within the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne. And lastly, uh, Felipe Severa has research interests in the interplays between theatre and performance theory with science and technology, as well as collaborative theatre making and collaborative academia. He co-leads the Performance Studies Space Program with Micah Bleeker and serves as associate editor of the journals Performance Research and Global Performance Studies. He's a lecturer of theatre in the School of Dance and Theatre at La Salle College of the Arts in Singapore and an assistant professor in the Centre for Drama, Theatre and Performance Studies of the University of Toronto. So with that quick introduction done, um, the speakers will be coming up to present for 10 minutes. And of course, we are navigating something of a tension between our interest in a very wide ranging discussion of literally universal proportions and deep time and the necessity to respect your time and our time. So uh, I'm going to 
give the speakers a signal one minute before their ten minutes is up. Um, I prepared some lead. Uh, I made a, a, a lead mask on, that I laid over the top of this piece of paper for 24 hours so that um, dark matter could pass through the lead, I hoped. Um, so there's a one-minute signal on that piece of paper. Um, I'll be holding that up to indicate so for you. So firstly, Auntie Carolyn, thanks very much. And you might like to sit down. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had the opportunity to meet him um, one night. We were talking about how we were going to look at developing further information in Indigenous knowledges within our sky, or waru, which is means our, or your heavens, or we do have our own words for these space. So my name is Carolyn Briggs and I'm also work at the um, RMIT as Elder in Residence at the present time. I've just submitted my PhD so I'm waiting. So I'm, I'm, I haven't got any other titles um, but that's, that's, that's about the, how we share the journey. And as I am the uh, descendant of the Yellowcup Willem clan of the Bundwala, we are pleased to be able to welcome you. And it's that, it is about that beneath the exterior lies the history of our First Peoples. The history which is not only complex, rich, but actually underpins the way this city has grown and, and developed. But it's also dismissed a lot of the energies within this city that you can't see our beautiful night skies and it's that all my life I've been when the stories were never written and we didn't have our access to our books we had a great playground the skies or the what were and how we could read the skies to be able to guide us in our principles of our life ways so it, what defined us. So it was about understanding those principles and understanding those values that are now part of this academic argument that we're now going to look at from, from, a, from a, a world of being out, growing up in a bush and then coming back. So the, the re, relocation of a lot of my people and how my great-grandmother was able to navigate when she was taken by the sealers from Preservation Islands to back to Melbourne. So it was all about the, the sky, the night sky was able to help them present, move back to their own country and be able to sing the songs. So it is about those songs, it's about the deep understanding of being. So when I think about getting involved in the night skies, it's how I read, how the old people teach me when it's time to hunt, when how to read when the emu is sitting and nesting, when the emu is ready to, we, the women would go out to hunt to get collect the eggs. It was all about that. But it's all about the diversity of those stories, which is, there is a myriad of stories right around Australia that reminds us that we have what the old people say, what's in the heavens is reflected on earth. We just haven't learnt to see the in-between. So it's those sort of things we need to think about. And it's, it's about those things that, that how history portrays the first people. And one of the comprising is only as a tragedy or dispossession. While there is no doubt there is an impact on the Europeans, upon our people. There has been traditional ways of life, which has been devastating. But we believe that our history was unique in a way in which our ancestors demonstrated their cap capacity to analyse and respond to these events. So there was moments of thinking, how would they teach us to move towards the futures? And there's those sorts of things 
that we can't dismiss. We still hold strong to it. And it's something that evolves us in working in partnerships with those sort of elements of what our Bun values and what is the European valuing our knowledges and understanding how the two can come together, particularly from a science base to a traditional knowledges. So it's, we're always constantly challenged and we're challenging understanding that there's two ways of knowing. There's a very Western paradigm that we, live, we exist in today and how we have to elevate the values of 2,000 generations of my ancestors that have lived on this land. And how do you dismiss that? And how do we create the narrative that one day will be a part of your discipline, hopefully? And it's been with people that have been a part of our world to bring, help us develop that narrative. And I work a lot with science works. Has any of you been to science works? <laughs> Where we created the night sky so that young children can get a, 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 a little snapshot of what they're, it's about how we see our stories. It's about the stories that reminds us how we connect. It reminds us how we move through our landscape, even in these amazing cities that we know as Melbourne. So it's those things that we're constantly being challenged. I think you will be challenged from understanding Indigenous ways of knowing, but neither is right or wrong. So it's those things. And these, this is actually what underpins the way we operate within our world. So it's those things, it is that complex but rich understanding of where we move towards together in a united way of creating stories. Because I think about the stories of how my family navigated from one place to another to be able to remind us of the songs that are really old and and slowly these things are being uncovered because they've been locked away in the archives of universities and museums and we've had, we're learning to unpack these information because there was a time that we only grow up with what knowledge was there, not out of a book. Your, your history is right. Ours is an oral tradition that has been handed down over many years and this is the complex of challenging what is oral history, history and giving a sense of um, the challenge that we recognise as the weaknesses and the strengths of our, but we also recognise the weaknesses and strength of the Western paradigm that we have to all exist under. So this is the challenge we will set for you and these are the sorts of things we need to think about that our old people do know those stories and there's a myriad of stories around this amazing continent we now know as Australia. And I know the work that's being done and trying to co collaborate through trust to be able to remind people on this continent there are stories that are in deep embedded into our psyche. And it's probably in the psyche of your cultures and your beings because we're all humans after all. So it's how you measure it in science and how you measure it from an oral traditions. So the two can be shaped and challenged, but that's okay. That's what research is about, isn't it? So I was thinking, if I think about the story I wrote in my, in the um, history of the story of Beramal, which is what you would know as the Seven Sisters or Pallades. So this gives you an indication of our understanding the way we read our night skies when it's time to find the nests. Because they're clever little flightless birds, these, e these emus or barimal. So barimal is a funny guy, a, a, big, a bird. 
who is too big to fly with short, useless wings. But apart from the funny appearance, the old man Barrymore has been cursed and will forever under, under the control of the female Barrymore, the emu. Because it's him that's got a nest. These are how we also know our seasons. This is the seasons in the night skies. We know it's known as Manami. Good. So that we've just finished that period that what you know as October. It's going into the fight where the little chicks are scurrying around. The father still has to mind them till once again he comes back to preparing for the next season. So it's all of those things we we need to understand how everything is an indicator and that's how we read. We read from books now, but you know how we read our environment. Everything is an indicator. Everything tells us the time and, and how we connect to that deep time, what you're talking about. Is my 10 minutes up yet? <laughs> so it is about those things we need to think about, understanding the diversities and, and unfortunately in these big cities, we don't get to see our night skies unless we go further out. There's a, probably a good example if you go to Lake Tyrrell, where you can actually see the great stars and the beautiful lake that's there that mirrors that thing. Is that what, our, like I said, what our old people taught us? What's in the heavens is reflected on earth. We just haven't seen the in between. So these are going to be your challenges. My challenge is, is that I'm going to be working on developing a, a, with Science Works to be able to get more stories into that night sky. Have I hit something? <laughs> so I can only talk on that much of it, it, that sad sense of history and how all people of first worlds have been navigating through the sky, through the skies that get them to where they need to go and become part of a new part of the world that we do know today. So I'm just going to close off on that one because I could tell you more stories, but it's just 10 minutes. So, but it's also about language. It's about we can't convert language into English. So English tries to convert it back. It's all these challenges. And it's also about our relationship with our ecology and our landscape. Everything is guided. It's just that you haven't, or we haven't been part of your process of putting it into that academic framework. We are slowly getting there and we're unpacking all these records because there was a time that we were to forget for up to 50 years after the 67 referendum. So we're navigating through these institutions to unpack a lot of the written documented information that our ancestors told the early settlers. So there are ways of our old people left things behind to remind us that they, we're still very much a living culture in today's world. And we're working with our young young um, creators in the in the art world or little gamers that are going to map all these things and create a, a, a myriad of stories throughout the, the unseen or the intangible knowledge that still exists within this beautiful city way that we know. So thank you. I would have loved to have had a chat with you earlier because we, we did recover a lot of stories. I'm glad you're here because we had long chats and, and it's been the way our young people are now able to reclaim reading the skies and I think you will be able to tell that story. Thank you. Thank you. Woman Jika, come with a purpose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, uh, for your welcome uh, and for uh, pointing to uh, the, the many stories that um, uh, we're going to need to understand. 
Um, this uh, uh, talk about um, dark matter from a physicist's or astrophysicist's perspective uh, is going to be a bit of a stream of consciousness. Uh, I've just put together ten uh, uh, thoughts about where uh, dark matter intersects things that would be of interest to artists. Uh, and um, uh, the first one is this um, uh, picture of the universe um, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And uh, it is the picture that answers the question, how do we know that the universe is 23% um, uh, dark matter? Uh, um, it is um, a temperature map of the universe. Um, and uh, you'll recognize the elliptical shape um, is just like a projection uh, of the continents on the globe. Uh, it's um, uh, with the North Pole at the top and the South Pole uh, at the bottom, uh, and it's um, uh, uh, in a coordinate system we call um, uh, galactic latitude and uh, longitude, uh, but you could just as well uh, imagine where Australia would be on that map um, uh, if this were a map of the globe rather than looking up. When we look up, we see a spherical surface, just like the surface of the Earth is a spherical surface, and that's how you get uh, uh, that map. It is a temperature map. The temperature of the universe um, 300,000 uh, years after the Big Bang uh, uh, had dropped to about 3,000 uh, uh, Kelvin, or 3,300 uh, centigrade, uh, if you like. Uh, and the map is actually very uniform. Uh, and where you see uh, blue, it's a little bit colder anywhere that it's blue. And where you see red, it's a little bit hotter the, than uh, uh, the mean. Uh, but when I say little bit, I really mean little bit because those are uh, microkelvins, um, minus 300 microkelvins in the blue and 300 microkelvins in the red. So we're talking about parts per million here of excess temperature. Uh, and those um, temperature and density excesses, uh, uh, as the universe evolved, uh, turned into galaxies and uh, formed stars in due course. So it's a very meaningful picture uh, for us uh, cosmologists. Um, uh, it contains everything that was known about the universe um, uh, at that um, uh, age. Um, and it's actually real data. It's not sort of um, the you know, creation of an artist um, wishing to make something uh, that would look nice. It's actually data transformed onto the um, uh, celestial sphere, as we call it. Now, uh, another intersection of dark matter with uh, uh, um, art is humour. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the best ones I know of um, uh, uh, what, might, what dark matter might be. Uh, no one knows what's in the dark matter sandwich, and that was true when the cartoonist drew it, and it's true today. We don't know. We're working on it. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, it looks like I hit the button twice. Okay. Now, we, have, we will have in the Stahl Underground Physics Lab when it's built, finished at the end of next year, and we install our experiment. Um, uh, I haven't got slides here of our experiment, but that's another talk. Um, uh, so the centerpiece of the Underground Physics Lab will be our uh, SABER experiment to detect dark matter and try to measure its mass and where it's coming from. Uh, but there will be other experiments as well, and uh, one of those that um, uh, interests astrobiologists who study how life arose in the cosmos uh, is called extremophiles. Those of you who have seen Brian Cox's um, programs uh, will um, uh, recognize that um, uh, it is thought by some, maybe by many, that life arose um, in a very extreme environment um, uh, on Earth. Uh, and so if you uh, go down a mine, you can go look in the extreme high-pressure environment of that um, uh, mine and look for organisms. So that is a subject that uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Melbourne uh, wishes to pursue in, the, in supple. A mine is like a city. 
uh, uh, an underground city. Uh, and here's a cut through uh, of the Stall gold mine. Uh, those of you who've been to Stall, uh, and I think I've got a slide at the very end here uh, that shows the uh, city fr from Big Hill, will know there's a big hill <laughs> uh, north of the city uh, and has a very good view, but um, uh, not everybody knows that, um, that there's a tremendously large um, network uh, of tunnels uh, dating from the earliest excavations to uh, the, the present day uh, under stall. Uh, and um, if I had a point, I don't think I have, but it doesn't matter. Um, I could point to you where on that map you can see the uh, uh, you can see the scale there runs down to 1,500 metres below grade, so 1.5 kilometres. And our lab is two thirds of the way down, so one kilometre uh, uh, below grade. And it's not very far from where the label Golden Gift uh, is. So uh, maps, of course, are uh, works of art. They always have been. They relate to um, uh, a reality and the need to navigate around, even underground. So this is a uh, handy sort of representation of where the Stall Underground Physics Lab will be and how we'll get to it. Uh, the Stall Gold Mine is a decline mine, which means that you don't go down a shaft to get to the bottom. You drive your truck down a helical uh, tunnel uh, on a 10% grade. So in other words, it, you drive 10 kilometres to get the one kilometre uh, down. Very interesting. A wonderful world underneath the ground. Uh, scientists always concern themselves with visualisation of data, and this is the best example I know uh, of um, uh, visualisation of dark matter. When we say visualisation, we're trying to convey what we see as, um, uh, as reality uh, in a way that um, uh, is intuitive or as intuitive as possible. Uh, and so what this is, is the bullet cluster. Uh, so you can see stars and galaxies in the background there, all that's quite uh, familiar. Uh, and you also see uh, a blue area and a red uh, area. So some colour coding has gone on there. Uh, if you look in a telescope, you don't actually see that red and blue. Uh, but um, what's happened is that two clusters of galaxies, clusters of galaxies are just a bunch of galaxies that are gravitationally bound to each other. Two clusters of, e of galaxies have come in from the, extre from the opposite sides of that picture uh, and uh, gravitationally been attracted, merged and come out the other side. Uh, and this happens a fair bit, um, but the clusters of galaxies also contain uh, not just galaxies but gas that belongs to the cluster. It's very hot gas. We call it X-ray gas, so it's uh, 100 million uh, uh, degrees in temperature. Uh, and so that's been colour-coded red. And so what's happened is that um, uh, the gas in the cluster uh, has hit the gas in the other cluster and stuck, and stuck in the middle, uh, which, contrasts with what was, which, which contrasts with what has happened to the stars and to the dark matter, which don't interact in the same way. Uh, stars in our own galaxy don't collide, and when two galaxies collide or two clusters collide, the stars don't actually uh, meet each other because of the uh, enormous distances uh, between them. So the stars have come out the other side, but so has the dark matter, because it's non-interacting. Uh, and the dark matter's been colour-coded blue, so uh, um, about this time in any talk, somebody puts their hand up and says, you told me you can't see dark matter. What's that blue stuff then? Apparently you can see it. Well, actually, it's a very clever experiment that has deduced the dark matter uh, mass from the images of stars that are in that uh, field. And the people who've done that get their credit on the, uh, in yellow there. 
Uh, and um, uh, that mass has then been mapped. You could map it with contours, for example, um, uh, but we've mapped it uh, in color. So the bullet cluster tells physicists a lot about dark matter, and a physicist I know says he thinks about the bullet cluster every night. I must move on. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, skip. Uh, oh, maybe I won't skip. Uh, this movie. Uh, perhaps, I knew, perhaps I need to skip it. <laughs> uh, now let's try this way of doing it. All right. Um, uh, Amongst the things that um, are dark in the universe are black holes. I'm not saying that um, uh, black holes are dark matter, uh, uh, but sometime when I can actually show that uh, movie that uh, doesn't seem to be working for me now, it inspired. Oh, there we go. Yes, yes. All right. It worked the second time. And if I press play, you will even see it. It's worth the wait. Um, you'll see that those are stars in the centre of the galaxy. And uh, if the movie is actually playing, you will see them moving. Oh, it seems to have dropped out. OK, well, that's, that's a shame. I'll, uh, anyone who's interested, I'll send them the link. And uh, uh, what happened there? <laughs> OK, let's um, put it back on track, please. I followed your instructions. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't. I'll let you do it. <laughs> uh, died. Yeah, let's go on to the presentation because I'm out of time and I need to finish. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, uh, another way you hear, another thing you hear often about dark matter is that it holds the galaxy together. How do we know that there's dark matter? The galaxy, our galaxy, would fly apart were it not for dark matter. And the way I like to visualise this uh, is using a pudding bowl. Um, uh, imagine you drop a ball bearing into the pudding bowl from the side, it will sort of go up and down and up and down. If you gave it a little bit of sideways angular momentum, it would go round a bit. Uh, but if you don't throw it into the bowl, it can't get out of the bowl. It's just going to come up the other side as far as you put it in. All right? That's all in, uh, intuitive. And so that's um, like the potential well that a uh, galaxy and its stars uh, lives in, uh, and that the dark matter particles that hold the galaxy together uh, create. So that's another way of visualising how the dark matter holds the Milky Way together. And this was how dark matter really in the 1970s first caught on. I showed you the picture of the universe at recombination, but that all came later. Uh, I mentioned that many lines of research are going to be pursued in SUPL uh, and the uh, ANSTO organisation which is helping us to uh, build it, uh, that's the outfit that's um, at uh, uh, Lucas Heights and also runs the synchrotron uh, uh, in Victoria. Um, uh, they will do biophysics at the extremely low background environment uh, that we have in, uh, or will have in the underground physics lab. Uh, and uh, biophysics and cancer research creates all kinds of beautiful pictures uh, that um, result from uh, staining cells and so on. So that's another whole area of artistic output that we will have. Uh, it's our intention and hope to build a visitor centre in Stahl uh, and um, of course, the interface of art and engineering is architecture. And so here's an architect's impression of what the dark matter discovery centre 
uh, will look like. Um, we hope that um, everyone will get a chance to, uh, to learn more about dark matter uh, and other things from visiting the centre and we intend to um, coordinate closely with the other uh, tourist attractions in the area such as the Brambuck Centre at uh, Halls Gap uh, and to exchange content with them. Uh, in addition, um, it's worth remembering that the human body uh, is impinged by all kinds of particles all the time uh, and neutrinos, for example, the ones that come from the nuclear furnace in the sun, uh, uh, just pass right through the, uh, the human body. That hasn't stopped people writing papers with an abstract that says, our results open a new window on dark matter. The human body is a dark matter detector. We can talk about that because I'm out of time. Uh, uh, Stahl has already won a um, photo competition from CERN, the place that operates the Large Hadron Collider in, uh, uh, in Geneva and that was during the preliminary works. So I'm done. Uh, I'm sorry I ran over, uh, uh, out of time. That is the view from, the, from Big Hill. Uh, and for more information, uh, all the questions that you'll have a chance to ask me, but the ones that I don't get, a, get time to answer are at that website. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Um, I've got a stream of words and images, not so much um, co uh, consciousness. <laughs> and I've got to go for my laptop. Uh, when I was six, where are we? There I am. When I was six, I dropped a brick on my toe. Um, it wasn't an accident. I wanted to see what would happen. The brick left my hands, fell through the air, landed on my big toe and rolled onto the grass. It happened very quickly and it really hurt. My sister said I was a bloody idiot and my mother said if I kept doing things like this I would be a ruin by Christmas. <coughs> Christmas came and I seemed to be okay. But I could not get out of my head, uh, replaying in slow motion the sight of the brick falling, the way it rolled onto the grass and the way it seemed to pulse there. The allure of the word ruin stayed with me. Ruin derives from the Latin rura, to fall, to collapse. From a young age, I was interested in how everything is moving and that nothing stays still. Oh, I think that's my laptop pressing on the... In high school, our geology teacher would quote Heraclitus, nature loves to conceal herself or nature loves to hide. She would answer our questions with questions, which was mildly annoying, but I respected the opacity of her stonewalling us as it enabled her to become the lithic subject that she taught. So we found our agency to anticipate partial geomorphic signs, to think of geology not just as a tectonic cycle of forming and breaking, but as an arcane force that inherently sought to remain something of a mystery. Acquainting us with the secret subterranean realms that exceeded our vision, we came to know deep focus earthquakes, subduction zones, brittle crusts and liquid earth. Land features that had formed through volcanic eruption, metamorphic folding and metastable states were now visible and compelled attention. She got us thinking about how their mesmerising forms conjured a feeling of the body, a feeling of the feminine, a feeling of the sublime and how they might be as much located in the physical world around us as within our own emerging psychological terrain. These formative adventures in geology establish the beginning of long-standing propositions for me. In witnessing the destabilising of form through a delayed temporality, we measure an effective register as much as the shifting of elements. 
geological events and artefacts afford an index of, of precarity that not only unsettles but compels a reimagining of a relationship to an increasingly unstable world. Geology provides a ground from which we imagine our lives. These formative uh, humans enduring relationships to volatile environments is central to my practice. And I seek engagement with communities that experience such relationships and researchers who monitor the Earth's movement. I work across sculptural objects, architectural forms and sonic signal within an installation-based approach to generate artworks where processes, forms and actions are informed by geological force and the resulting instability and transformation. I use my practice to investigate transitions of matter and I'm interested in a poetry of collapse and the insights that might be gained through amplifying the ruins and repair of the everyday. As a creative proposition, Erin Manning writes, becoming bodies fill with the world. Feeling with is not without thought. It is a force of thought. Don't mistake feeling with emotion. Emotion is the description of an effect. Feeling is its force. Affective tone is an environmental resonance of a feeling in action, a vibratile force that makes the milieu felt. Feeling is a pulsion to think, and thinking is a pulsion to feel. Thought feels a prospect for concepts within processes that become work. My research has led me to active volcanoes to witness firsthand the power of subterranean force, to feel its vibration and learn of the pragmatic and poetic strategies local inhabitants undertake to enable them to endure and thrive within proximity of their volcano. Do we want to update? <laughs> <laughs> I've got so many things here, hang on. It's because it I mentioned the volcano. I'll just say cancel. Anyway, I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> um, I, I think it's updating. Close it. I have made casts of the windows that afford me a view of the volcano before I climb it. The airborne volcanic particles become embedded in the catalyzing silicon, echoing the way the same grit falls into my eyes as I navigate the volcano summit. I record the volcano's volatility in situ with unreliable analog film stock, which persists beyond the moment of capture in its own slow state of disintegration. In 2015, I collaborated with the Department of Seismology, Earth Sciences at UTAS, the Institute of Mine Seismology, and unique earth rammed earth constructions to produce the work Underground. Underground presented a simple arc of um, arc wall comprised of rammed, recycled, crushed concrete. The architectonic form contained two earth mover inner tubes, carefully embedded in a friable mass and connected via hoses to an air compressor. The work sourced global seismic data from live web-based monitoring streams as well as local vibrations pertaining to human activity collected within the gal gallery in administration and public spaces through vibration sensors. The two streams of vibrational data, seismic events, were translated to electronic impulses, triggering the air compressor to release air and inflate the corresponding inner tube. Contingent on the intensity and duration of the local and global live seismic events, the inner tubes distorted within their rammed material constraints, shifting and destabilising the overall form, triggering a process of destruction over the course of the exhibition. As an immense contradictory, obje contradictory object, underground's material mass charged the neutral gallery space with a silent, ominous presence countered by the comical, if not rude, engorgement of the protruding, inflating rubber. I had no idea I was going to do that. <laughs> the form's uh, protracted collapse and unpredictable transformation elicited a state of suspended anticipation. 
Underground suggested a synthesis of body, architecture and earth. The live events and artifacts indexing a volatility and terror that consumes, compels and drives us. Our imagination, our sense of mortality and our deep connection to an unstable shifting earth. Uh, in 2018, I produced the work Variations on an Energetic Field for the Unconformity Festival in Queenstown, Tasmania. Approximately 800,000 years ago, an extraterrestrial projectile large enough to penetrate the Earth atmosphere system struck the Earth south of Queenstown. The force of such, uh, such an impact would release approximately 20 megatons of energy into the atmosphere ending a journey that may have started several billion years ago in the early solar system. Research for the work involved field trips to Darwin Crater and consultation with meteor impact scientist Kieran Torres Howard. Variations of an energetic field proposed a sequence of variations of energy across three sites in Queenstown. As part of the work, I was interested in how an object might simultaneously emit energy, attract and withdraw. How might an object's arcane content remain opaque, seemingly still and silent, yet the tremor of its matter continue as a physical murmur, keeping the object moving and reverberating, resounding in a less solid state. Darwin glass is an impact melt glass found in proximity to Darwin crater. Obsidian is a dark volcanic glass that lacks a crystalline structure due to the fast formation from the Earth's mantle to the surface. Variation 1 comprised of the Darwin Glass Obsidian Mirror, housed in the loft projection room of Queenstown's Paragon Cinema, and, uh, which consisted of melted Darwin glass and obsidian. It was intended to be a silent object, which didn't reflect rather absorbed and fused the viewer with the deep interior of the Earth, the Earth's surface and cosmic space, proposing a conflation of present, geologic and solar system matter and time. Europeans in Tasmania became aware of Darwin glass and the hypothesis of a meteor impact around 1905. Queenstown, Queenstown's Empire Hotel was constructed in 1901. Variation 2 was sited in the Empire's cellar where objects reflected an imperial occupation, the material and form simultaneously precarious, muted and transitioning. A tiered chandelier suspended in the centre of the keg room resided in a state of sustained phase transition. Its toffee prisms shifted from a solid to liquid state at a varied rate, according to the degree which the toffee had been cooked. The chandelier's globe flickered erratically, visually pulsing a signal captured from a meteor's trajectory in space. The heat from the lamp accelerated the toffee's transition. A modest timber fireplace stood in the centre of the cellar. The hearth and mantle were rammed with crushed local quartzite so that the earth material filled and consumed the form. Transducer speakers were attached to the earth material. The sonic signal of the meteor's trajectory was transferred into the rammed form, the gritty material absorbing the vibration and silencing the sound. Hanging from the ceiling rafters of Queenstown PCYC were gymnasium hand rings and trapeze bars embedded in blocks of ice echoing the existing aerial gym equipment. Frozen, in, frozen into each block was a stratum of local quartzite. As the ice melted, the rocks fell. Variation 3 was a variation of John Cage's 1-6 in collaboration with violinist Alethea Kuhn. During the course of the exhibition, Alethea performed Cage's 1-6 composition, responding to the ice block's transition. 1-6 belongs to a body of work in which Cage developed the time bracket technique, where the score consists of short fragments, frequently just one note, with or without dynamics and indications in minutes and seconds, of when the fragment should start and when it should end. Variation three was a very Queenstown variation of the work 
where the scale of the ice, rocks and acoustics were amplified and intensified. So in just finishing in terms of dark matter, some propositions which are forming for me include how might we fathom matter that is sticky in that it binds the universe, stuff, together, yet it simultaneously is immaterial. If dark matter has an effective tone, how, we might, how might we feel it? Might its tenuous presence offer insight into ways to respond to our increasingly unstable world? Thanks. I didn't prepare slides, but um, can I bring a website up? Yeah. That'd be fantastic. I'll let you do that. Excellent. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak today, and thank you so much, Naomi Carolyn, for that introduction. It's fantastic. You talked about half the stuff I was going to talk about, so it's fantastic. Um, I've been very happy and excited for the last um, 10 or 12 years to be very privileged to learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders and communities across the country about their ancient star knowledge. And what I have learned from the elders in the communities has been quite life-changing for me, and it's something that ties in very closely with everything that's going to happen <clears throat> in the collaborations like this. We need to look and focus more on transdisciplinarity. It's not done enough. There's a lot of talk about it, especially the top ends of institutions, the high brass talk about it, but on the ground level, it doesn't happen enough. So it's phenomenal to see opportunities like this arise. We can bring scientists. We can bring artists, we can bring indigenous elders and custodians to share knowledge and to find ways that we can move forward together and explore things in a very different light that we haven't considered before. It's kind of funny thinking about that in a new light considering we're talking about dark matter. We are talking about dark matter and dark matters. What do we mean by that? How can a quarter of the universe be something we can't see or interact with? And it reminds me of something that we have here in Australia. There is a lot of dark matter about indigenous knowledge. The dark matter isn't from the indigenous people, it's from white Australia. That's failed to recognize and acknowledge and learn from Aboriginal views and Torres Strait Islander views and knowledge systems for a very long time. There's still a lot of resistance to it, as I think Andrew Bolt showed you when he was having a go at uh, Uncle Bruce Pascoe recently, but water off the duck's back, right? There are dark matters here because white Australia hasn't taken note of this. And when I began learning about indigenous knowledge from the perspective of an American guy coming in from astrophysics, knew absolutely nothing about it. And even though I was very receptive to it, what I thought I knew about it was completely wrong. And the elders have been fantastic in sharing knowledge and information with me. That has been very revealing. As an astrophysicist, for example, we look up and we see the twinkling stars. Everybody knows the lullaby, twinkle, twinkle, little star. The twinkling stars are beautiful. As an astrophysicist, they're a pain in the backside. They're a nuisance. There's something to be overcome. We want to get rid of it. We put telescopes on mountaintops to try to reach as far above the atmosphere as we can. We develop complex uh, optical systems to help erase the twinkling of stars. We even spend billions of dollars putting telescopes in space to get away from that wonderful little phenomenon we see. But what the elders have taught me is a totally different way of looking at that. It's not about seeing it as something to be overcome. But as, as uh, Narrowit Carolyn mentioned before, everything on the land is reflected in the sky. And the elders tell me that if you want to know anything about our knowledge, you have to know how to interpret, how to read the stars. And knowing how to read changes in the properties of the stars. So twinkling stars is an example. I like to get the audience interactive a little bit. What are some of the other properties about the stars you notice when you look up at the sky? 
What are things you notice about the stars? Space between them? The space between the stars? Exactly. What else? Patterns they make in the sky. Exactly right. What else? The brightness of the stars? The colors of the stars? Exactly. How they move, where they are relative to the horizon? All of these things have special significance. And knowing how to read those and to be able to read and interpret changes in the properties of those stars are what is critical. Western astrophysics, Western science has given zero recognition to this. That's something that we're working on changing and something we're trying to change the minds of fellow astronomers. So it's great to see opportunities like this arise. So the twinkling stars, what about them? What's interesting? When I was in the Torres Strait a couple of years ago, I had read somewhere about the Solomon Islanders had used the twinkling stars, how to look at them to predict weather. I thought, wow, that's quite interesting. I've never heard of that before. I mean, it makes sense. I'm going through the physics in my mind about how that could work. And I was up at Murray Island, Mare. This is the home of Eddie Quakey Mabo. Um, Mabo Day everybody should be familiar with. And I remember sitting with the elders and the, and some you know, kids, parents at the school on top of the island. And they were all singing star songs for me. I was recording them on my camcorder. And um, they're all in language, in the Mary and Mary language. I have no idea what they're saying. But I'm just sort of like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. And later on in the week, I met with one of the elders, Uncle Allo Tapham. And he explained, you know, I, I actually asked him. I said, look, Uncle, I've, I've heard about this twinkling star business. What is this? It's like, oh, yeah. Well, if you know how to read the way the stars twinkle, it can tell you how to predict weather and how to forecast for seasonal change. OK. How? As well, you look at the very bright stars that are high above. Don't look at the ones lower on the horizon. You look at the bright stars high above. How fast are they twinkling? Are they twinkling quickly? Are they twinkling slowly? Because that tells you how fast the wind is blowing. Do they look kind of fuzzy, or are they kind of sharp? Because that tells you if there's humidity in the atmosphere. And if they're blue and fuzzy and twinkling, you know a storm is fast approaching. I remember thinking, blue, wait, what? Blue is not a color you see very well at night. When your eyes adjust to that, you don't see it very well. And I remember thinking on that for a few minutes, and he was very patient, gave me time. Um, and then I, I realized what I had been taught in chemistry years before, that water absorbs red and green wavelengths of light. It's very bad at absorbing blue wavelengths of light. So if you have a storm, high winds, a lot of moisture and humidity in the atmosphere, it's going to make the stars twinkle. It's going to make them look fuzzy. And all that water in the atmosphere is going to absorb the red and green wavelengths of light. So what you see are fuzzy, twinkling blue stars. Uncle Allo was teaching me the physics behind this without ever using the term physics. He didn't put it in the mathematical framework necessarily. But he taught me knowledge that had been passed down for who knows how long. There's a world of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge that we need to be looking at and examining. And the funny thing about that is he says, oh, we even have a song about this. I said, oh, yeah, can you sing it for me? He's like, we already did. It's on your camcorder. I went back to my camcorder, and he's sing, you know, the, they're singing, the, the song's called Huerna Skystrada, which means twinkling stars. And as they're singing the song, he's translating for me what it means in Miriam Mirror. Why is it so calm tonight? Why are the stars twinkling like embers in a fire? It's because of the big wind that's going to shift from the southwest to the north. It's going to bring rain clouds that are going to come in. Why is, the star, why is the stars twinkling so brightly tonight? The stars, as Nabi Carolyn mentioned before, it's oral tradition. It's not written down. How do you pass this knowledge along? You pass this knowledge along through narrative, through story. They're not myths and legends. Myths and legends, that's a rubbish term. They're knowledge systems passed on through a narrative. That narrative tells you about the science behind it. It tells you about the culture behind it. It tells you about the social rules behind it. It's all-encompassing. It is transdisciplinary. So it was, I was blown away by thinking about this, but also made me think about something else when we talk about dark matter and dark matters in a more broad context. And that is something that we just recently published a paper on with uh, an Aboriginal student I'm mentoring at Monash, my partner, uh, Bon Mott, who um, themselves is actually a, a performance and sculptor artist um, doing work on neutron stars is the cultural genocide that occurs through light pollution by erasing the skies. 
modern Western white culture, yeah, we don't seem to care that much about it. We'll just spend a few billion dollars to put a telescope in space to figure out what we need to know. But when you erase the sky, you erase that millennia old traditions and connections to the stars, where your life, your well-being, everything you know is linked to the stars. When you can't see that anymore, it's being erased. And when it's actively being erased by development, by fracking flares, which are a problem to astrophysicists and astronomers at places like Siding Spring, when this is happening, it is erasing the skies. When you erase the skies, you erase that connection. It's no different from stealing the land. I got one minute left. Yeah, yeah, go away. Bloody hell. You're erasing the sky, you're erasing the land. So finding ways in a transdisciplinary fashion to work with designers, engineers, artists, astronomers, ecologists, to find ways of preserving our skies, of reversing the effects of light pollution. That's how we're going to be able to move forward another dark matter issue. So looking at this sort of knowledge and this information, I've only given you one example. I mean, I, Auntie and I can sit up here for hours and tell you tons and tons of stories that relay tons of information about astronomy. But I did bring this up because I want everybody to be able to have a chance to see this. This is a website that we developed a couple of years ago that we constantly update. It's all about Aboriginal astronomy, and you can find our research on here. You can find information about uh, the important people. I want to show everybody this because I know it's always a bit weird seeing this white American guy talking about indigenous astronomy in Australia. Come on, Australia, good grief. You got better internet than that, don't you? <laughs> Tongue in cheek. 14 years I've been here, it's a nightmare. Anyway, there's a whole generation of Aboriginal people who are earning degrees in astronomy and astrophysics who are becoming the face, here we go, who are becoming the faces of this. So Dr. Stacy Mater, as far as I know, is the only Aboriginal PhD qualified astrophysicist. He's Gidja from the very tip of WA, and he works at the CSIRO. Um, astronomy and space science. He actually works at the DISH in parks. Carly Noon is a young Aboriginal woman. She's just now, like this month, completed her master's degree in astrophysics at ANU. And her and I, this year, signed a book contract with Allen and Unwin Press to write The First Astronomers, which is going to be all about indigenous astronomy across Australia and around the world. It's not going to be an academic book filled with academic jargon. It's going to be, hopefully, a more enjoyable book. <laughs> Kirsten Banks, who you've probably seen on, you know, The Drum and Q&A, Chris O'Donnelly, they're really skyrocketing. Their profiles have just gone to the moon and back just in the last couple of years. These are the faces you're going to be seeing, but there's a whole new generation of Aboriginal people earning degrees in astronomy and astrophysics, including three new students that I've met at the University of Melbourne who are going to come do research projects with us. So, that's going to tie in with the work we're doing on dark matter. It's going to tie in with the work that's happening on gravitational waves, and it ties in with the work that we're doing in Astro 3D. So we're really looking at a transdisciplinary way of trying to see how we can move forward and solve the problems of the future by looking to the past. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm the last one. Um, but actually, I think now I see why you went first. Um, okay, so I am a theater and performance person, uh, but this specific area of my work has little to do with theater and performance itself. I'm more interested in the ways in which different paradigms of astronomy or astrophysics perform larger regimes or paradigms of knowledge. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking about two areas of my work. The first one is I'm going to be sharing about two initiatives that I am part of um, that are hopefully transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary, although we're not really caring about checking those boxes in the university. We're just genuinely interested in exploring ideas about the universe and cosmology and astronomy. Um, so the first... Uh, initiative that I want to share is a performance study space program. This is a project that I co-lead with Professor Mike Blicker from Utrecht University. We're very lucky that uh, Utrecht accepted to host this project, so actually has some sort of institutional backing. And what we do is uh, we're interested in collaborating with astronomers, with cosmologists, with astrophysicists to see whether there is an actual 
a productive intersection between performance theory and these fields of scientific inquiry. We have three lines of inquiry. The first one is performance as representations of science, technology, and the universe. And here, perhaps we can think of theater more clearly, uh, you know, like science fiction theater, science fiction movies, the, the big wave of uh, lunar travel operas that happened in the 19th century in Paris, for instance. Uh, the second line of inquiry is performance as method of interdisciplinary research. In this line of inquiry, we are interested in dialoguing with, uh, with scientists, with physicists, and we're interested in the practices of astronomy themselves and how those practices are actually creating the world. Uh, material practice interaction with, 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 uh, with instruments, with telescopes, so the performativity of science, really. And then uh, the third one that is much more speculative is astronomy and cosmology as fields for performance theory. And those, uh, you know, dealing with, with, with this line of inquiry is really, uh, yeah, truly speculative because the question is how the universe performs. And those are questions that are naturally interdisciplinary. We, we can't answer them by, by ourselves. Both Mike and I are performance scholars, so we try to constantly be in dialogue with people that are more knowledgeable in those fields. And how this, the space program works is that uh, it's somewhat associated with Performance Studies International, uh, which is one of the two big uh, organizations of theater and performance studies globally. And so whenever PSI, which is the acronym for Performance Studies International, whenever PSI holds its conference in a country that actually has some sort of astronomical activity, we try to dialogue with, 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 with the astronomers. Our latest activity was in the University of Calgary in July of this year. We had a day-long symposium with astronomers, and it was all about data visualization and how data performs in the images, the aesthetic dimensions of those images. The second uh, uh, initiative that I am part of and that I want to share uh, with you today, a, a purpose of art science collaborations, is Cosmica Institute. Uh, Cosmica is an initiative uh, led by my fellow Mexican artist, Naum, which is one of the few artists that has a piece of work on board the International Space Station. Uh, and Cosmica organizes festivals, organizes talks, organizes uh, symposiums. And, uh, and right now we're starting to work on a new book series uh, that tentatively is going to be called Space And. And the first two types of that series is going to, are going to be one book, Space and Feminism. Uh, there's a lot of things to be said from the feminist perspective about space exploration, not least the amount of female uh, astronauts that have been launched into space com in, in comparison to the, to, 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 to the male astronauts, but also how space exploration is gendered. And the second book in the series is uh, probably going to be called Space and Decolonization, or space and indigenous astronomies, uh, depending on really to what extent can we access these materials. And for that book, I really resonate with what you said. We're thinking of this book really like an online resource with oral histories instead of a print book, precisely because much of this knowledge is not really written, it's transmitted orally. Uh, so those two initiatives uh, are examples of how arts and science can, or you know, astronomy and dark matter can come together in some sort of organized institutional framework. The second part of what I want to share with you today are three entry points that, from my perspective, are interesting to think in terms of how can dark matter research intersect or interact with indigenous astronomies. So my work is closer to cultural astronomy than theater and performance as, 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 as art. And uh, what I do, my, my whole trip is I'm very critic uh, of the epistemology of outer space. Uh, it's an epistemology that finds its roots in the first waves of globalization as enacted by European powers in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. And you can really historicize when this begins to happen in the first novels of interplanetary travel. For instance, the first time that, or one of the first times that the notion of a jet propulsion jet appeared in European literature is in Cyrano de Bergerac's A Trip to the Moon. And it's a really funny story because the character, the, the, the lead protagonist of the story, wants to go to the moon, but he can't figure out how. 
So he attaches a bunch of beers to his back and he shakes himself and then he opens the bottles and ideally the proportion of the bottles of beer is, is going to take him to the moon, right? But obviously he doesn't land on the moon, he lands on Canada. And, and a bit troubled by the trauma of flying transcontinentally, he thinks that he landed on the moon, so he goes around for several days thinking that Canadians are lunatics, right? Are people from the moon. And you know, it's really this, this, this codifying of the universe as a, as a radical other, as a political analog that has your same, uh, uh, the same cultural or the same institutional framework than humanity. And, and what it happens in its last consequences is that it codifies the planet as a territory that needs to be protected. It codifies military technology, it codifies the discourse and the cultural impact of, of astronomy and of space exploration. So my, my, my whole claim is that the extraterrestrial is a dimension of human practice. And that if you historicize it, you can really untangle or unpack the epistemology of outer space, which is, you could say, what rules contemporary space exploration, and try to figure out all the ways in which we can interact with this dimension of human practice. That is that which we, is not really terrestrial, not really within our perceptual uh, domain. Uh, so, with that in mind, uh, the first notion or the first thing that I think that dark matter research and indigenous astronomies can come together to discuss is the notion of the absolute. It seems to me that uh, precisely because we can't really figure out what exactly is dark matter and we're trying to figure out how to measure it, as Jeremy was mentioned, through very clever um, experiments, uh, the absolute seems to be put into question when we think of dark matter, right? The, any claim towards an absolute knowledge of the universe gets unsettled when we think of dark matter, our incapacity to actually know it. And in terms of indigenous astronomies, the absolute is also one category of knowledge that creates strata, right? Uh, so whomever has a claim to absolute knowledge, therefore has a claim to decide who doesn't have a claim to absolute knowledge or absolute power. Um, so, in terms of indigenous astronomies, one of the things that we can learn from Aboriginal astronomers and Aboriginal practices or indigenous practices uh, in current literature and cultural astronomy uh, is often assumed that all of these astronomies can be just put under the blanket as the other of contemporary astronomy. But in fact, each First Nation or each uh, indigenous society has a view of the sky. And that view of the sky is also temporally sensible. The view of the sky of a thousand years ago is not the same sky that we see today. So the absolute uh, is also multiple. There are several absolutes and this is something that we can begin uh, uh, investigating. How, 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 how the absolute is performed, how the knowledge of the absolute is performed astronomically speaking. And I'm going to be fast because we have to, be, have to go to the second part of this talk that is a conversation. And the second topic that I think that is, actually I, I, I think this is, in my thinking, this is much more articulate, and I think is pressing, uh, is an issue of sovereignty. Uh, so I want to read a bit of a paper that I read a couple of months ago in a conference about tropical performances in which I, 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 I yeah, well I read. Uh, between 19, 29 November and 3rd December 1976, representatives from Colombia, Ecuador, Congo, Indonesia, Kenya, Uganda, and Zaire, with Brazil as an observer, proclaimed the Bogota Declaration to assert rights over the geostationary orbit. The declaration was a reaction against some of the foundational precepts of space law as put forward in the Space Treaty of 1967. Along with the Moon Treaty, these documents constitute the foundational parameters for the legal and legitimate use of space. While neither of the treaties are really legally binding to any of the countries that sign them, they do pose the initial jurisprudence upon which key issues like satellite routes, limits of space mining, etiquette on lunar landings, and general legal ethics in astronautic practices are addressed in the context of international and astropolitical relations. More specifically, the declaration highlights what for equatorial nations may be a crucial shortcoming of the treaty. 
The treaty states, I quote, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation or by any other means, end quote. Although the point of that article in the space treaty is to counter any potential colonial impulse towards outer space, it also means that the orbital space directly above equatorial nations, where geostationary satellites are permanently placed, will not be governed by the nation directly beneath. That means that, you know, there's going to be a whole, well, there were a whole belt of satellites on top of countries in the equator, and what is the legal, there's a legal loophole there, right? These, these countries have a satellite on top of them and they, they, they can't control the sky, which means that the sky is occupied. Uh, and I go back to the point on, on decolonizing or at least trying to demonopolize the skies. <clears throat> the geostationary orbit is a circular orbit on the equatorial plane in which the period of sidereal revolution of the satellite is equal to the period of sidereal rotation of the Earth and the satellite moves in the same direction of the Earth's rotation. When a satellite is placed in this particular orbit, it is said to be geostationary because it will, be a, it will appear to be stationary in the sky when viewed from the Earth as a fix on the zenith of a given point of the equator, whose longitude is by definition that of the satellite. In all, Article 2 of the Space Treaty denies the possibility for equatorial nations to hold sovereignty over their skies. Moreover, this loophole also opens the possibility for the privatization of the sky under the mask of an astropreneur seeking to benefit all mankind. The privatization of outer space is itself a political problem with consequences that we can only start appreciating today with the consolidation of, a private, of private stakeholders in the space industry. This problem, however, and as the declaration made evident, has been solved for equatorial nations and to non-spacefaring nations ever since the launch of Sputnik uh, I. So, to, to sum up, the whole point, something that we need to address, and perhaps artistic practice and cultural practice is a way to do so, is that um, all this infrastructure that uh, explores the space and that makes us understand much precisely what is our role and what is our location in the universe, what is our interaction with other kinds of matter, is built by consortiums of universities, stakeholders, and often like the laboratory in the mine by infrastructure that, you know, is, 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 uh, is co complicit of colonial histories, of settling histories. So the issue of space exploration, dark matter research, astronomy, and its implications to colonial legacies cannot be denied. And, and in the end, whose land is, 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 is going to be occupied by science? whose sky is going to be occupied by science, and what are the dialogues that need to happen between the people that you know, are in that land or that look at that sky with the research that is going to take up the space and the sky to figure out what is our role. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. It's hard to know where to start with such a, a, a rich and diverse range of um, lensings of dark matter through your various practices and research. But one thread that I can see going through is this sense that that dark matter is not something remote and out there and completely unknowable, but it is something that suffuses our experience here as part of a planet that's part of a galaxy um, that is also part of an intimate human world. And I think, Carolyn, uh, at the beginning you talked about how the heavens are reflected in Earth. And I really also <laughs> think about that in relation to Lucy's brick dropping on her foot and 
also what Jeremy said as well about the, um, the idea that the human body might be this index or, or dark matter receptor, is, which is a, an idea that you're challenging, but nevertheless you brought dark matter back to the human body. So um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about how um, art can perhaps broker this quite, quite grounded conversation about uh, the, the geopolitics of place. Um, um, Felipe talked, talked about how um, this, this research station is going to take place in a site that is, is meaningful to communities. And I often think of artists as a kind of brokerage between communities, between activists, and between science, and between particularly indigenous interests as well, um, to keep this conversation like we're having now, um, to create those those opportunities. So perhaps I'll, I'll open that first to, to Carolyn. To now I'm recorded. So sometimes I think about when we're exploring a lot of these issues, particularly with indigenous ways of knowing, is that sometimes we have to begin with baby steps. Go back and find the wonderment as a child exploring the skies and maybe it's through using those sort of things about art and, and the, everything of the living things that are around our little people and, and, and growing with that again. Because sometimes we, we analyse things too much and, and we don't think about what it was before. And it is the explore, exploration and what dropping that brick. I've dropped a brick on my toe. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> you often wonder, you know. But um, it's those things that I think that when we're exploring Indigenous knowledges, it is being, going back to the child that was allowed to learn the wonder, how you would read the skies. And, and it is those dark spaces in between the stars and how you map those stars and map those stories when you're working with young people and allowing them to discover it. I remember taking young ones out to Mungo and I had to remember how the old people taught me to see and reflect on the stories of the sky, at the night skies. And I, had to, I went into a monotone because I was actually trying to map it and um, I had 15-year-old boys from one of the well-to-do schools and they were laying out there and we got mapping through the sky and I thought, it's getting darker, it's getting really dark and I've forgotten to tell the bus driver to put the lights on so I could get out of here. And uh, it was after a while and I realised I couldn't explore the sky anymore but the lecturer said, that was like a yoga mantra. You've sent these these young people off into a journey. And um, the young boys all said, we went with you through the skies. So if it's those sort of things in exploring the ways we learn things, um, and that's the way we learn our ways of understanding, how we under how we codify our world, with our plants, our birds, the moon. We do celebrate our moon. We danced to our moon every the new moon. That was one of the things of in our way of coming together and celebrating stories and shared stories. So it doesn't quite answer everything, but it is take baby steps, particularly when you're working in Indigenous understandings of the cosmology, the Astro astro astronomy, because it is about how we then explain the way we see our world. Yeah, when you were talking about the Pleiades and the, the, the story of the emu, I was thinking about coming from New Zealand, the, 
we understand it as, as matariki, that cluster, but it also has the same function of describing when it's the time for the planting and, you know, the, the Duane's beautiful recounting of the, the twinkling of the stars as an indicator of when, of what weather might be coming. So there's a, there's a really embodied link to astronomy that's, that's in every day. It's the sort of quotidian nature of it um, and the, that getting over that separation of the, the outer space that I, that I think um, I've really taken away from those. It's a new way of reading without all that technology, but it helps. We love that, so thank you. I'm good, Jim. Um, so I, I guess, Jeremy, um, thinking about the, the exploration of dark matter in relation to, to the human body that, that we sort of left hanging because um, the, 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 um, the slides were we're going too rapidly for the time or something. <laughs> I just wondered whether you could you could tell us a little bit more about, because I was really interested in the discussion of, of the extremophiles, but also um, to, to just talk us through the, the science of dark matter in relation to embodiment. Well, dark matter uh, interacts with um, Everything. <laughs> ordinary matter uh, very weakly. Uh, if it actually interacted strongly with ordinary matter, um, it would be hard for uh, life ever to have evolved. Uh, and um, uh, if the um, uh, interactions were, for example, uh, as they are with um, uh, alpha particles and, um, uh, and gamma rays, then you can see that um, uh, dark matter would be uh, uh, destructive of uh, life and that's in a way a proof since life exists uh, that um, uh, dark matter is a weakly uh, interacting uh, form of matter. Well, I, I, in fact, I, I, I actually want the... I'd like to invite some of the speakers to respond to each other's presentation. Is there anything that has come up for you in witnessing each other's presentations that you'd like to comment upon? <laughs> well, uh, well, just thinking about Jeremy's... Jeremy said a couple of things. There was something about map... Uh, map relates to... a a form of reality? Did you say something like that, Jeremy? Um, yeah, I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, I liked that. <laughs> but um, I th it got me thinking about um, art and science and I guess what I feel is important um, as an artist and in engaging in some way around science is that art uh, isn't about a representation of science or data or information, but it's an opportunity to provide some form of proximity of experience, um, which in a way is relating. So I, I guess I was getting that from your comment about uh, the map. Yeah, everybody um, uh, has seen some of the ancient uh, European and ancient Mediterranean uh, maps of the globe that... Uh, uh, contained mythical beasts and things populating the areas that were uh, unexplored. So um, um, maps are a, a progressive thing. As you uh, fill in more about reality, you begin to build better maps. I want to pick on the point of the body. Um, I think that that's a really interesting entry to any kind of artistic, yeah, research or collaboration, um, even though if it, it is not within the perceptual you know, capacity of the human body to perceive not only dark matter, but gravitational waves, uh, but, you know, all the kinds of waves that intersect with our planet, with ourselves, I think that's, that's really generative uh, entry point for any conversation about astronomy, astrophysics, and, and artistic research, theater and performance, of course. But music, especially, uh, there's a long tradition, especially in the 20th century, of musicians experimenting with, with, with Spanish sounds and um, of different kinds. 
I can think of an Indonesian artist, uh, Vensa Christ, that uh, he, he, he crucifies himself and then he puts do-it-yourself antennas on his body. He captures you know, radio waves from the sky that may or may not come from exterior space, may also come from the building next door, but whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and then he, he downloads that, that, that sound into a mixer and mixes, and then he has a rave without music, right? <laughs> it sounds very basic, very trite even, but sure. that's an entry point in which you really evidence the extent to which our body and our immediate material environment is always intersected with the universe. Right, and it, it exemplifies the extent to which we are, as Carl Sagan once said, we are in space. Um, so th I think that that's something that is worth recovering and, and highlighting that our bodies are the entry point into any kind of intersection between arts and astronomy. Um, um, I'll just uh, invite the audience also to yeah. consider some questions that you'd like to ask uh, after we just have one more Yeah, I, I just point. had um, one more thought for Lucy said something beautiful about the the eff effective tone of dark matter, and I, I also sort of link that to your thoughts, Jeremy, about your um, friend uh, astrophysicist who thought about uh, the bullet constellation every night. So obviously this is um, something that has, has deeply entered his psyche, and in fact that was something Carolyn mentioned as well, this kind of psychic connection to the skies, and that's why. Um, you know, the, the, the light pollution that erases the skies, as Felipe mentioned, is so um, viscerally um, e su such an act that of, decolon of colonial violence, I guess, in terms of the, the cityscape. So I guess, um, I guess the, re the role of affects and feelings is where I'm going with that one <laughs> in relation to artistic research and scientific research into dark matter. Uh, yes, the I've I've had some interesting discussions with uh, First Nations Mi'kmaq astronomer named um, Hildy Nielsen, who's at the University of Toronto. He's an astrophysicist, and when we put our our preprint of our paper, which is coming out in the inaugural issue of the Journal of Dark Sky Studies. Um, we try to be a bit provocative 